The hundred or so films in the Wildlife on One series have featured animals of all kinds. Big and small, venomous and harmless, ferocious and cuddly. The animal featured in this film, which is one of the series' many award winners, is perhaps one of the smallest. But in my view, it is one of the most alarming. Hollywood and the producers of horror films have long been intrigued by the idea of giant ants taking over the world. In fact, there are no giants, but there are over 12,000 species, and the truth about ants is even more extraordinary than the myth. This, for example, is an army ant soldier, and its jaws are formidable pincers, as biologist Nigel Franks knows only too well. The tips are shaped like fish hooks and easily penetrate human skin. Muscles within the ant's head draw the jaws together with great strength, and once locked in a bite, the ant can't easily free itself. The jaws continue to bite fiercely, even when the rest of the body has been pulled away from the head. Indeed, South American Indians use them to stitch together open wounds. Nigel studies army ants in the jungles of Panama in Central America. Each day he tramps the trails, searching for these voracious insects as they march through the rainforest on their great campaigns. Army ants are specialists in carnage. The Huns and Tartars of the insect domain, they can seize and rip to pieces prey many times bigger than an individual ant. Army ants sting as well as bite. Their venom quickly paralyzes victims whose fate is sealed from the moment they're pinned down by the seething mass. For much of their lives, they are nomads. They raid through a different area of the jungle each day in search of food, which they take back to their temporary home or bivouac, this brown mass beneath the tree, where they rest and spend the night. The bivouac is a living basket of ants. Its foundation, walls and roof are all built from the bodies of the ants themselves. Getting close to a bivouac is a dangerous business, and Nigel treats the inhabitants with cautious respect. He's been stung and bitten only too often. The feet of army ants have special hooks which allow them to link together in chains. These living suspension cables form the framework of the bivouac and stretch between twigs and branches. The strain on individual workers is tremendous. Each can support up to 30 others. But sometimes the tension is pushed to breaking point and the scaffolding tears apart. 
Nigel's main study site is on Barra Colorado Island, the famous research station in the middle of the Panama Canal. The island was once a hilltop, and separated from the mainland when the lowlands around it were flooded to form Lake Gatun, now part of the canal. The easiest way to get around the island is by boat. Nigel estimates that there are around 50 army ant colonies on Barra, Colorado, but finding them isn't easy. As he walks, Nigel watches and listens for clues to their whereabouts. Disturbed animals, or the distinctive sound of ant birds which follow the swarms, are good signs of the presence of a raiding column. Few sites of the tropical forest are as impressive as that of a colony of army ants on the march. Every morning they raid in a particular direction. This species, the largest army ant, Echiton bertilii, is a swarm raider. Faced with these huge invasions, those who can make good their escape. A female scorpion with her babies. But few invertebrates can evade the dragnet. A whip scorpion is captured, overrun by the onslaught of ants. The members of the army cooperate perfectly on tactics and have but a single purpose to harvest as much food as possible and take it back to the bivouac. They behave as one huge superorganism, a strange amorphous creature perhaps, but one which is a deadly efficient killing machine. Scorpions, despite their armor and poisonous stings, are no match for these fierce ants. Incredibly, the ants are virtually blind. Their sorties are mainly coordinated by touch and chemical communication, though they may be able to detect polarized light filtering through the canopy to help them navigate. The stakes are piled high against the inhabitants of the leaf litter. But it's not just the ants they must contend with. Any creatures escaping the ants must run the gauntlet of their camp followers. Predatory ant birds accompany the swarms, feeding on flushed out insects. The birds don't eat the ants, which are poisonous and indigestible, but concentrate on prey driven from hiding by the attacking ants. For these birds, army ants are valuable allies. Their regular invasions of fresh parts of the forest ensure a reliable supply of food. The birds even spend the night sleeping near the ant bivouac, so they're around at the start of an early morning raid. Flies hover around the advancing columns. They are parasites and seek an opportunity to dart down and quickly lay their eggs on cockroaches or crickets. During a day's raid, the colony may march more than 200 meters, sweeping out a great area of the forest floor. Nigel has discovered that the direction of their raids is remarkably constant. This reduces the risk of them re-entering areas already cleared of prey. It can be an uncomfortable business. Army ant campaigns are not confined to the ground. The columns will sometimes even climb high into the canopy in pursuit of quarry. 
On Barro, Colorado, the combined raids of all 50 colonies clear out an area of 10 million square meters every year, equivalent to two-thirds the area of the island. But their role is not merely destructive. Army ants are conservationists in their own unusual way. In a sense, they farm the small creatures they feed on, for raided areas are avoided and effectively left to lie fallow. Other social insects, including ants, form a major part of their diet. But they don't get it all their own way. Even tiny ants can put up a vigorous defence. As Tekka ants work together to pin down isolated raiders, effectively removing them from the fray. In an area which has been pillaged, it may take months for the insect populations to regain their former numbers. But by creating in the forest a patchwork of recently cleared, recovering and fully recovered areas, army ants help maintain the diversity of leaf litter animals. For Nigel, it's an exciting experience to get close to ants returning with booty. The ant highway at Rushar provides a macabre guide to the other inhabitants of the forest floor, which can be identified from their remains. The brood of other social insects is a major delicacy on their menu. Transporting large portions is a difficult road haulage problem, since the pieces have to be carried back to the bivouac a distance which is the ant equivalent of 20 miles or more. Teamwork helps them shift big loads. A group of ants can carry an item, the fragments of which they couldn't budge if split between them, just as two men can move a piano, but neither alone could lift half a piano. For around 20 days every month, the army ants cease their nomadic wandering and remain camped at the same site in order to raise a new brood of young. The stationary phase in their reproductive cycle allows Nigel to carry out experiments around the bivouac. He's interested in how it functions as a shelter and how the ants keep its internal temperature at an optimal level for the healthy growth of the larvae, which look like white grains of rice suspended deep in its interior. The queen lies hidden near the centre. Despite being in the tropics, temperatures fluctuate as much as 8 degrees centigrade in the rainforest between day and night but the ants are able to regulate the core temperature of the bivouac, holding it around a consistent 26 degrees. By crowding together tightly, the ants trap the heat generated by their own bodies. If the interior temperature rises too much, the workers on the outside move apart, allowing cooler air to enter. With such extravagant jaws, the big soldiers can't clean themselves. Smaller ants perform the duties of valley. Nigel considers ants as rather like silicon chips on legs and the colony as a computer. His own computer helps him to analyse his data and to have some fun modelling army ant behaviour. The behaviour of army ants is like a vast computer game in which the strategy of the ants is to zap as many prey items as possible, running up a high score in booty returned to the bivouac. The more booty, the greater the number of larvae which can be reared to take part in future expeditions and the bigger the ant population becomes. To work out the detailed effect of army ants on the economy of the rainforest, we need to work out how much of the forest floor has been raided at any one time, as is represented here, how long the leaf litter fauna takes to recover, and so on.
By using computers to generate video models, biologists are beginning to understand the complex game that goes on between the prey and their predators. Here, the nomadic phase is ending and the ants form their permanent bivouac. Raids from this site rotate around the hub of the bivouac, the ants returning at the end of each raid. Amazingly, the next raid will head off 123 degrees away from the original direction. Subsequent raids are also separated by 123 degrees. This maximizes the exploitation of fresh areas around the fixed campsite. When the young have emerged, the colony becomes nomadic again. Colonies of army ants are in competition. As they snake around the island, they must avoid crossing areas other colonies have raided. If they encounter the trail scent of a rival colony, they terminate the raid and next day head in a different direction. Army ant colonies are gigantic, but the tiny world of a petri dish is home to equally remarkable ants living in Nigel's lab at the University of Bath. This large ant in the foreground is a slave raider, and those others around it are its slaves. They are a different species entirely, and their job is to feed the larvae in the nest and look after the needs of their masters. This slave maker colony came from Sweden. In the wild, such slave makers normally live inside twigs or acorns, but these artificial nests suit them well. Some of the most unusual slave making ants are to be found in the deserts of Arizona in the United States of America. Here, other biologists are going to extraordinary lengths to learn more about them. John Conway excavates these deep trenches to uncover the nest chambers of honey ants, which may lie as deep as five meters underground. Of all ant species in the world, the honey ant must surely be one of the most bizarre. Specialized workers, called repletes, act as living storage vessels for the nectar collected by foragers. Through the lean winter months, the entire colony survives by feeding on the honey regurgitated from the swollen abdomens of the repletes. John Conway collects the repletes to analyze the contents of their crops. The darker sacs contain proteins, fats, and the sugars, glucose, and fructose. It seems the lighter colored repletes mainly store water with traces of sucrose. The ant's underground reservoir of water is another important adaptation for life in this dry habitat. Some repletes may be slaves stolen from neighboring nests. The Indians of the American Southwest and Mexico valued honey ants as a delicacy. Their nectar was even used to treat disease, and they also make a tempting snack for a hungry biologist. Other Arizona desert dwellers are also fond of ants. In the nearby Chiricahua Mountains, the most spectacular of the slave raiders, the Amazon ants, mount their operations in search of a new labor force. They're probably called Amazons because they are all big red females. Through the summer months in the late afternoon, the legions set off to plunder other ant nests. They're led by scouts who have already discovered target colonies with rich pickings. Black formica ants are their preferred slaves. Fierce fights break out around the colony under attack but there's little hope for the defenders of the besieged nest. The red Amazon ants, like all slave makers, are heavily armored with huge jaws for fighting. Some Amazon ants merely wrestle with their opponents, temporarily pinning them down. Other species use their sharp, sickle-shaped mandibles to pierce the brains of their victims, killing them instantly.
Having broken through the surface defenses, the Amazons penetrate deep into the heart of the Formica nest to loot the brood chambers. Even here, the fighting continues as the defenders hold out to the bitter end. The success of a slave raid is measured by the numbers of larvae and pupae captured and carried off into bondage. The adult ants are not taken. Up to 2,000 Amazons may set out on a foray, and on a successful day they may seize as many as 3,000 Formica pupae, depending on how far away the raided nest is from their own quarters. If the distance is not too great, and these ants will march 300 meters in their hunt for future slaves, many of their battle-hardened soldiers return to snatch more bodies. Back inside their own stronghold, the Amazons scatter their booty into every available space. Here, the Amazons' involvement with the kidnapped pupae ends. From now on, they will be looked after by an earlier generation of Formica slaves, many of whom may have been removed from the same colony as their new charges. The Amazons are parasites, but they do not entirely destroy the communities they ravage. Instead, the slave raiders leave enough adults and young behind to guarantee a regular supply of servants in the future. As the stolen pupae develop, they become more recognizably ant-like. When they finally emerge, the new workers accept the odors they first experience as their own. The smell of the Amazon colony is imprinted on the young slaves, and they go about their business just as if they were at home in their own colony. The Amazon ants are entirely dependent on their slaves for survival. They can't even feed themselves, but receive all their nourishment from the Formica, who forage for food and tend the eggs laid by the Amazon queen. When not out raiding, the Amazons sit around the nest doing nothing until it's time to embark on the campaign trail once again. The Amazons operate on a grand scale. But in his lab at the University of Bath, Nigel Franks watches his tiny slave makers play out their dramatic lifestyle on a tabletop arena. Here, a scout sets out to reconnoitre possible nests to raid. When the slave maker, the larger ant on the right, meets a member of the opposing workforce, a fight soon develops. During these initial skirmishes, the slave maker secretes a chemical known as a propaganda substance and smears it on the host workers it's wrestling with. This chemical has a remarkable effect. It causes the workers to ignore the slave maker and turn on one another. The slave maker can then break out of the scrum of ants and sneak into their nest to examine its contents. Once inside the nest, the scout searches for the brood chamber, deploying the propaganda substance, if necessary, to confuse and distract attention from itself. If the brood chamber contains a healthy supply of larvae and pupae, the slave maker will pick one up and head off home with it. The scout's return with a potential slave excites its nestmates. The new larva is examined closely, and soon other individual slave makers prepare to leave and raid the freshly discovered source of future breadwinners. In their natural habitat in northern forests,
communities of these minute slave makers and the slaves which provide their workforce live in hollowed out acorns and twigs. The slavers do not raid over large distances and never form into big columns. Instead, they move off in ones and twos, led by the scout. They may be minuscule, but they are pugnacious, superbly efficient fighting machines. They have to be. Their main duty in life, after all, is robbery with violence. The vanquished litter the field of battle. At the height of the offensive, the front line forms into a series of scrimmages. Eventually, the leading troops of the invading force break away from the melee and push into the nest. The slave makers must destroy all resistance. Their continued survival depends on stealing more larvae, which will eventually care for them. As they press deeper into the tunnels, the Blitzkrieg reaches its peak. When the combatants grapple, chemical weapons are used by both sides. But the poison from the defenders' stings is no match for the propaganda substance released by the marauders. In all the confusion, the aggressors gain entry to the brood chamber and its living treasure. The tiny world of these ants is a never-ending cycle of war and peace, but the slave makers never completely destroy the colonies they raid. The queen usually escapes with her retinue and will return in the aftermath of the raid to resume the rearing of her own kind and provide once again slaves for the alien body snatchers. The ants are an ancient group and have lived on Earth for a hundred million years or so. We've glimpsed only a little of their astonishing diversity. There are a lot more surprises in store before scientists get anything like a complete idea of how ants organize their extraordinary lives. Well, next week, Wildlife 100 tracks down the elusive urban fox, while next tonight, we're off to the East End. Thank you.